introducing the Bite Me Cannabis Club. The Bite Me Cannabis Club aims to be an inclusive online space for cannabis lovers. Whether you're simply curious about how cannabis can improve your life or you're fully seasoned, there's always more to learn. When you join the Bite Me Cannabis Club, you'll have access to like-minded people interested in cannabis, monthly workshops, live Q&As, recipes and recipe swaps, digital cookbooks, a fully functional chat feature, and a whole lot more. For a limited time, it's only $5 a month with a 30-day free trial so you can try it out and see if it's right for you. This isn't just another Facebook group or confusing Discord channel. I carefully chose a platform that offers a clear, uncluttered, and seamless community experience. See for yourself. Join today. Say hello. I can't wait to connect with you there. Join the Bite Me Cannabis Club today. Link in your podcast app. This episode, I sit down with Elizabeth Rice, certified gangier and wine sommelier. Welcome to Bite Me, the show about edibles where I help you take control of your high life. And I'm your host, Marge. I just want to say thank you for being here. I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. Elizabeth was in the wine industry for over 20 years before she transitioned into the can- cannabis industry. And she learned quite a bit over those years on developing a palate and tasting and appreciating wines. And a lot of these things have incredible parallels in the cannabis industry. And you're going to hear about that. You're going to hear about pairing food, wine, and cannabis together, about different tips and tricks on how to taste and appreciate cannabis and wine. And I think you're really going to enjoy this. And so without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Elizabeth Rice. All right. I am joined today by Elizabeth, a fellow gangier and a wine sommelier. And Elizabeth, can you say hello to everybody listening? Hi, everybody listening. Happy to be here. (laughs) Great. Thank you so much for being with me today. I'm really excited about this conversation because obviously I have a, a love affair with cannabis, but I also do enjoy drinking wine as well. And you and I met initially during the Gangier certification exam writing process. And it was during that time, I think even a bit before that I found out that you were a wine sommelier as well. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a bit about um, what a wine sommelier does. Yeah, totally. Um, So essentially, as a wine sommelier is generally an expert in wine. You know, they'll assist consumers, whether in a store or restaurant, um, on their wine selection to help them give a ultimate experience, you know, that fits their needs. Uh, Wine sommeliers study wine very intensely, and they really, you know, we really practice, you know, to understand the nuances of aromas and flavors, you know, to the point where when I'm tasting a wine, I can start identifying what varietal is it, you know, where is it from, you know, even when was that wine harvested? So it's just like a, has a, you know, a really in-depth knowledge of that wine. And how long does it take for someone to get that kind of certification and to get that kind of depth of knowledge about, because wine, I mean, it's vast, just like cannabis, there's a vast yeah. array of, of options. Totally. Yeah. And, and it, uh, it varies. You know, um, when I first started in the wine industry, it took me one year of working at a winery, tasting the same wine over and over and over again for 365 days until I started to really understand the nuances of the wine and really started to identify like, oh, that's cherry. Oh, that's cranberry. Oh, that's chocolate. Um, so it depends on, you know, the person's palate and how long it takes them to start connecting those dots. And then, of course, you know, there's various programs like the WSET and, you know, the Sommelier Guild that you can go through. And they have different levels, starting from a beginner level, which can take a few months to a more advanced level like diploma, which can take about two years. And then, of course, you have your Masters of Wine, which it's taken some I've known like eight to 10 years to become a Master of Wine. Wow. And do you have any aspirations to become a master of wine yourself? No, none. Oh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a lot of tasting and a lot of like very intense. There's a great movie called Psalm uh, and they really show kind of that level where those, the, the students were trying to become master sommeliers and it's intense. And yeah, I've got enough intensity in my life in the cannabis industry now. Right. And so <laughs> what drew you to the cannabis industry? You obviously spent quite a bit of time in the wine industry and now you've tr- transitioned 
what what was it that prompted that change? Yeah, well, I spent 20 years in the wine industry doing international sales, selling wine around the world, and I loved it. But, you know, I was born in Mendocino, California, which is part of the Emerald Triangle, you know, so cannabis has always been a part of my life. I've always, be, you know, recognized the benefits of it. Um, but it was illegal. <laughs> and right. I was like, okay, I just, I'm not brave enough. I admire the pioneers in the industry who went in, you know, no matter what, if it's legal or illegal, I, I just wasn't that brave. And I decided to go into wine instead, because I was still very fascinated by wine and how complex it was. And so I got my degree, uh, my undergrad degree in wine business and then, yeah, hit the ground running. And then when I, when I noticed like Colorado and Washington went legal and California went legal and I was getting, I was like, oh my gosh, it's, it's happening. I can like finally get into this industry. But it was after I got my MBA that I decided to move into the cannabis industry. Cause at that time I felt, okay, I have enough business acumen um, with my MBA and 20 years of wine business experience to come into this industry and really help build a foundation and structure, you know, to, to be, a pioneer, so to say, in this industry and help it grow globally. And do you see a lot of parallels between the cannabis industry and the wine industry? Oh my gosh, there are so many parallels. It's quite amazing. I mean, the, the first thing, of course, it, they're both about the plant. They're 100% at mercy of mother nature. She's in charge of what happens, really. Um, they are very diverse. They're very complex. They're very volatile, you know, products because, you know, of that plant aspect. And they both are about experiences. You know, you drink wine as part of a social experience or you want to relax after work. You take cannabis as, you know, part of a social experience or you want help with pain management. Um, and so that's, you know, both have a lot of benefit in terms of experiences, also helping people. And so, and in terms of the industry structure, I see a lot of similarities too, as both are highly regulated, both are highly taxed, um, and both are complex, like the level of knowledge that people have really vary. So education is imp so important in both the industries, which is you know part of the reason why I wanted to be a gangier. Right, of course. And do you feel that what can the cannabis industry learn from the wine industry? Because obviously the wine industry has got a, you know, a big head start. Yeah, I know the wine yeah. industry has been around for a while. Funny enough, cannabis has been around longer, but right. the wine industry has been more social, you know, accepted and legal for, you know, longer in our, our modern time. And, you know, the one thing I found that the cannabis industry that can learn from the wine industry is to slow down. Um, this industry moves so fast. And I see that it moves like 10 million times faster than the wine industry. And while it's important to be quick in this very emerging you know, industry, it also really opens companies and people up to making really detrimental mistakes. Um, there's a lot of businesses struggling in the cannabis world now. And a lot of that is because of regulation and taxation, but obviously, and also because they're pivoting so quick, trying to keep up and then you make mistakes. You know, the wine industry um, is a little too slow for my taste now, but the wine industry does have that ability to slow down, evaluate decisions, and then make a right decision for for the brand and the company. And what do you feel makes cannabis different from wine tasting or learn or wine education? Oh, totally. Well, I mean, besides, you know, the obvious, like one you, you smoke or rub on your body, the other one you drink, um, you know, they're, they're very similar in many ways, but there's also one thing that cannabis has that wine doesn't have its effect. You know, wine, if you're drinking a Cabernet Sauvignon or a Pinot Noir, the effect is the same. You still get a buzz. You, you know, you still have that alcohol effect. When tasting cannabis, you get vast array of effects, you know, like, oh, my body's balanced or, oh, I'm uplifted. Or, you know, oh, I'm really relaxed and sleepy now. So the effect base in cannabis is so powerful and so much different. Like that was my learning curve when I was learning how to taste cannabis and how to evaluate cannabis. The effect part was the part that I had to really take my time with and think about, you know, after I consumed a cannabis flower or concentrate, like, how am I feeling? How does my mind feel? How does my body feel? With alcohol, that never comes into that, that evaluation when you're tasting wine. Um, and the other thing too is the amount of time it takes. I, I like to use like judging, you know, competitions as an evaluation of that because, you know, a wine competition judges, you know, they'll usually take like three to four days to go through like flights and flights and flights of wine because they can, you can really taste anywhere from like five to six wines in one sitting and you're fine. You can go wine, 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 wine. With cannabis, 
it usually takes like one to two months to do a proper cannabis judging for a competition. And that's because you could really only do one flower or concentrate within like an hour or two period, because you have to get the effect like through your system. Otherwise you're not going to be judging the next one fairly. So yeah, just the time it takes to evaluate them. It's a lot different. I remember in the Gungier program, when we sat down for our live training, we took seven hours to evaluate <laughs> one flower. <laughs> yeah. So I recall doing something similar too. Yeah. I <laughs> loved wild. it. It was yeah. wild, but it was yeah. amazing. And it was so in depth. Like we would, we would not do that in wine. Like I've been in wine tastings where we'll take maybe an hour to evaluate one wine, but, but that's the max I've ever spent evaluating one wine. Seven hours for one flower is a record. <laughs> and do you feel that some of the the palate that you've developed through wine tasting over time has directly translated into tasting the the flavors and aromas of cannabis? Oh, absolutely. Yes, 100%. Um, you know, because it's the same idea. You know, when you're tasting wine, you're looking like, okay, is there fruit? Is there floral? Is there earth? Um, you know, is there spice? And you kind of dig down and think about what you're tasting and feeling. And I found that same thing came in cannabis. You know, when I would take an inhale of a nice flower, I'd be like, okay, do I taste fruit, floral, earth, or fuel? Which one of those fours am I tasting right now? And then I dig deeper and go, okay, now if it's fruit, is that red fruit, yellow fruit, you know, blue fruit? Like what color is that fruit? And then you go down, is it blueberries? Is it lemons? And so you just kind of start digging down deep, just like I would wine. So it helped a lot to have that right. experience with wine, to go into cannabis and then be able to identify. And I found that was one thing that Gangiers, a lot of them had a, an issue with, a challenge with is identifying those characters they were tasting and, you know, I was happy. I've had a lot of conversations and even developed a chart for the Gangier program to help students be able to break that down and, and make it easy for them. Right. Because like you said, there's once you, you could say fruit, but then there's a whole list of different types of fruit and they can vary so much. And uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, It is still something that I'm constantly working on myself to keep developing my palate as well. But I mean, that's part of the fun too. But I do. And the experience part is interesting as well, because like you said, I've drank lots of wine and the end result is always the same. But with cannabis, those terpenes really dictate the effects and those effects really that's whether you're going to enjoy that cannabis or not. So 100%. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and your experiences will be different than someone else's. So you might be able to identify things that other people won't. And that's, you know, because of your experiences with food and other flavors. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always tell people there is no wrong answer, though, when you're tasting wine or tasting cannabis. If you taste, you know, lemon rind in there, then you taste lemon rind in there. Right. So there's no real right or wrong answer. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, there's no real right okay. or wrong answer. I mean, it's nuances. I mean, obviously, if you have a group of people and everyone says there's, you know, apple in there and only in one person says there's, you know, something totally opposite, you know, blackberry, then maybe that maybe you're not right. <laughs> you know? right. So you got to put a consensus into right. that when you have more than one person. <laughs> right. Now, what made you decide to become a certified gangier at the, at the end of the day? Yeah, totally. Well, when I decided to get into the cannabis industry, the first thing I needed to do was increase my education. So I had an understanding of the plant and was able to talk about it in a professional manner, even a deeper than my own personal experience. So I took green flower courses right off the bat. They have a great website with a lot of one-off courses. So I took them right away, it really helped me give me a foundational knowledge. When I saw the Gangier program though, I was like, this looks very familiar to me, the whole structure of it. Um, and I was really excited to increase my knowledge uh, you know, that way it would help me be able to speak to buyers and bud tenders who here in California have a very deep knowledge understanding. And so I wanted to make sure that I knew what they were talking about, that I can talk to them at that same level and then even help educate them. Because, I mean, I love teaching. I love talking about things I'm passionate about, which I'm passionate about cannabis and wine still. Um, and so I when I saw the Gangier, I was like, oh, this is perfect for me. Um, and interestingly enough, the Gangier program it turned out to be very much modeled after the WSET, which is the Wine and Spirit Education Trust program, which is the pathway to become a master of wine. So, a lot so of very wine. interesting, which leads to the next question, which is, would you therefore see a lot of similarities between scoring and assessing wine and cannabis, like the structure of those assessments? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I even did an evaluation for one of the study sessions where I showed people like, here's the WSET, you know, SA, 
you know, SAT tasting protocol and here's the Gangier SAP tasting protocol. Those are similar names. Um, and both have appearance, both go through the aromas and both go through the flavors. And within each of those, there's different categories, which also match nicely. I mean, granted, cannabis will have, you know, different nuances. Like when you're looking at the appearance, you're looking at the trichome density, you know, and the intact trichomes. Well, wine wouldn't have that. But with wine, you're looking at the color, um, you know, and, and any, you know, cloudiness or anything like that. Where they differ, obviously, is the effects. Cannabis, you know, has that, which wine, you know, in, in WSET, we didn't grade effects because it was always the same. The other difference um, in it, too, is the scoring system, right? Wine is, as you guys probably seen, it's a 100-point system. So, you know, if people want their 90 points and 95 points, you know. Right now, the, the Gangier program's out of a 10-point system, which also works. Um, I would not be surprised if we see that move to a 100-point system, though, because that's really where consumers are comfortable with and familiar with, thanks to wine. And I have to admit, when I go to the wine store, I do look for bottles with the sticker on it, <laughs> admittedly, because I, I figure somebody has evaluated that wine that knows more about it than I do. Yep. Do you think there'll ever be a point where we might see stickers on cannabis jars? 100%. It's, it's going to come. Exciting. Yeah, it's coming yeah. fast and furiously. I think the most important thing, though, and the Gangier program has a great opportunity to do that, is to make sure it's valid and that it is a fair assessment. You know, because you don't want them, you know, you want third party assessments, but you want to be fair and, you know, not skewed. So then when you take that score and you put it on there, it's legitimate. It's like, yep, this person or this group, they have a fair palette. They scored it this amount. And then you have more confidence that what you're going to pull off the shelf is good quality. Right. That would be very exciting to see, actually. Totally. Um, Now, for somebody who is not going to become a wine sommelier or a gangier, but they're still interested in pairing food with wine or cannabis, what would you say is the best way to approach that? So I always take it um, by matching weights and flavors. The first thing you want to do is match the weight of the food with the weight of the wine or cannabis. So let's say if you have um, a lighter food, like a fish dish or something like that, you want to put it with a lighter wine. And just like cannabis, you have a lighter dish, like you know, fish or sushi, put it with a lighter cannabis, maybe some citrusy type cannabis, some nice light sativas. If you have a heavier dish, like, uh, you know, like a steak, put it with a heavier wine. You want Cabernet Sauvignon, heavier food. You put it with a heavier type of uh, cannabis, like maybe some OG Kush, something with a fuller flavor. So first you match your weights. And then I said the other word, you match your flavors. So if you have a real fuel-y type cannabis plant, then you want to put it with kind of a more fuel, maybe not fuel because they don't want to eat fuel, but maybe a more minerally style dish, you know, oysters or something, you know. So that way you want to match your weights and match your flavor. And with wine, you can get you know, like really into these exact pairings and how they play off each other, like sweet, sweet, salty, salty, bitter, bitter. But really the first lesson is match your weights and flavors and you'll be fine. And that sounds like a really easy thing for most people to grasp because you don't really need any kind of specialized knowledge to think this is a lighter wine or lighter lighter cannabis with a lighter food. So that's fantastic advice. I really like that. Um, Should you start with pairing the food with the wine or like, like what's the best approach? Because say you want to go a little bit beyond just matching the weight and the flavor. Like what if you have a cannabis that you like? What's the best way to go? Like start with the food and then go with the wine or the cannabis or start with whatever wine or cannabis you have and you want, then go with the food. Yeah. Now you want to start start with the cannabis or wine you have first because, you know, it's it's easier to change the food character. It's not as easy to change the cannabis character. So, right. you know, if there, yeah, I would say, okay, what kind of cannabis or wine do I want to do? So like if, you know, I, if I was organizing a, a, a wine dinner, for example, I would think of my themes, like, okay, what's my theme for this dinner? Okay, let's do wines from Napa Valley. So, you know, okay, I'll do some nice, you know, oaky Chardonnays, some full bodied Cabernet Sauvignons, maybe some late harvest Zinfandel. And from there, then I would start developing the menu to pair with the wine. And I would do the same thing with cannabis, because if you start, well, you can start with food and try to match something with it. It's just going to be harder to find that thing to match with it, because it's not as diverse as being able to change a character in a food. So essentially, definitely start with the wine and the cannabis if you already have it on hand and then go from there. Yes, exactly. Okay, Okay, perfect. Now, do you have any uh, further tips for pairing 
or sorry, for tasting a good wine or just tasting wine in general? Yeah, totally. Um, and one tip too, when, if, when you're doing food and wine or cannabis tasting, um, you know, when you're pairing them together, always taste the wine or cannabis first. So if you're smoking like a, a pre-roll or sipping a wine, do that first, then try the food and then take another sip of the wine or a hit of the cannabis after the food has left your mouth, because that's part of the experience. You see what it's like before the food, you taste the food, and then you see how the food really altered the effect or the flavor of that wine and cannabis. It's just like a real party in the mouth. So you take it slow and you really think about what you're tasting and doing and go, you know, cannabis wine, then food, then cannabis wine. Um, some good tips though, I always say, you know, for wine, I always end up teaching everyone the five S's when it comes to wine tasting, because it really helps people take their time with it, uh, you know, and, and appreciate it instead of just like chugging it going, Oh yeah, it's good. I say, Nope, do the five S's. And the first thing you do is you see the wine, then you smell the wine. And when you smell it, you, you know, give, I always tell people smell without swirling and then swirl and smell and see what happens. And when you do that, when you swirl the glass, it allows the esters to really come out and cap and get, you know, gather in that glass. And then you get a lot more of the aroma characters. The next thing you do is you sip the wine. I always tell people, take a little sip just as you normally would. And then I have them, okay, now take another sip. But while that wine is in your mouth, suck in a little bit of air. And when you suck in that air while the wine's in your mouth, it really opens the wine in your mouth and you taste more. So it basically aerates the wine inside your mouth. Um, and so people are always amazed at how much more they taste. They're like, wow, how'd that happen? And then the next step is you have to decide, you know, if you're if you're just in a casual location, then you can swallow the wine. If you're doing competitions, you should be spitting it out to save your palate. And the last step is to savor it, you know, to think about what you're tasting and, you know, to enjoy the moment. Is it long lasting? Is it spicy? Is it really short finish? You know, just thinking about how you feel afterwards. Okay. And what kind of tips would you have for tasting cannabis? Yeah. And interestingly, it's, it's kind of the same. Um, you know, the first thing with cannabis is you want to look at it. So if you have a really nice, you know, cannabis flower in front of you, you want to look at it, see, you know, how is the bud really tight? Is it loose? You know, do you see a lot of nice trichomes or crystals? What's the color? Is it really brown or really bright green? You know, and, and, and then you want to smell it. And when you smell it, you're looking for, you know, what kind of character are you, are you smelling? Are you smelling any flaws? You know, does it any like moldy notes or anything, um, you know, or does it smell really fresh and bright? Then you would then take a hit of it. So either suck it. I was trying to think of an S, so I guess you could suck it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could. <laughs> for that one. So, I mean, you would take a nice hit, whether you're smoking with a pre-roll. I prefer smoking out of a vaporizer because I so find, I. yeah, it's the best. I find with vaporizer, yeah. it's, it's heat, not burn. So you're just heating the flower um, instead of burning off the terpenes. And when you heat the flower, then you get all that terpene character and are able to identify a lot more. If you're smoking a pre roll you're burning the terpenes and I just get a lot more burn character um and then same and the nice thing too when you're taking that hit is similar to wine remember I said take a suck a, a sip of air in with the wine in your mouth do the same thing after you take a hit of your of your vaporizer is suck in some air afterwards and it not only helps you not cough but it also helps you with the flavor you taste more you're like ooh, there's more there and then of course you release it and then you think about the finish, you the savor, you know, and how does it taste? How do I feel? And um, so it's a very similar process, cannabis. And right. Wine. And it sounds like at the end of the day, the process really involves just a person slowing down. Yes. Like you said, that savoring part, if you slow down, then you're going to notice a lot more. And whether you're just doing this for your own fun or because you're actually assessing a cannabis or, or a wine product, but either way, slowing down always allows you to notice more. Exactly. So, slow down. Yes, <laughs> we yes. all move so Which, fast these days. I know. It does. Slow down. <laughs> it's very true. And what's nicer than sitting down in the evening with a nice glass of wine or something packed in your vaporizer. So slowing down is, I love that. Now, what about pairing weed and wine together, forgetting about the food? Because um, I don't know about you, but I have enjoyed many a glass of wine and cannabis at the same time, even though sometimes they don't recommend that, but 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's true. I mean, I, I, I would, yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. I would be very cautious to people because obviously they'll play on each other and it can catch up to people really quick. You know, if they're drinking a wine and and hitting their, you know, hitting their pre-roll or eating a gummy, especially like you can get cross faded pretty quickly. So Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, go cautiously if you want to don't drink too much. Um, Don't take too much cannabis. Um, But you know, I agree. I've had those moments where I've tried, I, I, you know, I had a nice pre-roll and then I'll sip my wine and it's very enjoyable, but I would be very cautious to people about doing it. Like I would suggest either choosing one or the other, not both. Right. So you don't recommend trying to pair them at all? No, I would not try to pair them because they, they don't, they don't play nicely together. (laughs) You are right about that. It has been a while since I've really done that. I have in the past not, and it wasn't a lot, but sometimes, you know, I'm enjoying a glass of wine and then have a little bit of weed too. But typically I do do one or the other. Yeah. Because it kind of, the crossfade is serious. (laughs) Serious. Well, they kind of amplify it too. Like if you smoked a pre-roll and then you have a glass of wine, you like, you feel a lot more of that wine than you would have otherwise. So it really amplifies each other. So that's why it's cautiously, you know, I'd say be cautious or don't do it at all. Right. Yes. So what about you're planning a romantic dinner and you have, you want to, you want to just set the tone and the table just perfectly for someone special. How would you go about choosing the right cannabis and the wine in that instance? Oh man. Um, yeah, that's, that's amazing. So like my husband and I love to do like wine, like nights or cannabis nights. Um, I think first you just have to make sure that with cannabis, especially that it's a consumption method that both parties prefer you know, some people like eating gummies, others like smoking. Um, so you have to make sure like, okay, this person really likes smoking flour or, you know, so let's have a nice, you know, vaporizer night and create a nice meal. So creating an ambiance, but you have to know what that person across from you likes. And it's just like wine, you know, if they don't like red wines, don't like white wines, you don't want to bring to the table a big Cabernet Sauvignon or Zinfandel. You know, you want to make sure that you bring something that the other person really enjoys that you both can enjoy together. Because when it comes down to it, consuming wine or cannabis together is about an experience and it's a bonding experience. And so you don't want to bring something to the table that the other person's going to be like, oh, I don't smoke or, oh, right. red wine gives me a headache. So you yeah. really want to understand what people's preferences are. And then, yeah, and then, then you set the table and then you look at your, you know, food and wine pairing. You think about what you're going to be doing that night, uh, you know, about watching a good movie and keep it in a safe environment. Too. I mean, the last thing you want to do is be in an environment that's uncomfortable for anyone or even dangerous. So, you know, make sure you have safe driving options so you're not driving while consuming. So then you can relax together and have a fabulous evening. I really do like that. Those are all great. That's all great advice and kind of leads into the next question about the best approach to offering cannabis and wine when you're having guests. And you did touch in on, of course, Choosing the consumption method, which is probably something I actually didn't really think about because you're right. If somebody only eats edibles and you're offering them, you know, your vaporizer full of something tasty, then that's not really going to go over that well. Uh, Safe driving options is another good one. But are there other things that you should consider when you're having people over to consume wine or cannabis? Yeah, I think um, your dosage is really important. Uh, You know, know your crowd coming in if they're heavier users or if they're new to cannabis. And, you know, or if they smoke or only eat, but I'd say your dosage levels you have available is very important. I would always recommend keeping it lower dose. So, you know, like one to two milligram drinks are amazing for parties because that way, you know, you know, people are just micro dosing. So you don't have to worry about anyone having too much and then ruining the party or having a terrible time. So always having those micro dose options are very important. If you're having a party with a lot of heavier users, they'd probably bring their own cannabis anyways. So you probably don't have to worry about them. (laughs) Right. No, that's very true. And I do like the mention of the low dose. I was at a dinner party a few months ago and they did keep it pretty low dose, but that meant over the course of the evening, you kind of got a bit higher and higher, but then by the evening's end, you were, you weren't like totally sober, but you definitely weren't too bad. Like Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever been to any like cannabis dinner parties yourself that you thought went off really well? Um, yeah, I mean, I yeah, I have been to some like the various cannabis events, um, and yeah, and I think they've gone over very well. I went to one where we did have a, a professional cannabis chef there, 
And he knew the measurements for dosing because when you're eating cannabis, it could be kind of scary because, you know, someone who doesn't know what they're doing, things can turn ugly pretty fast. So you want to make sure that when you're eating cannabis, that you are consuming from a someone who knows how to dose it properly. And so, yeah, I had this amazing event with this cannabis chef and he made these incredible sauces and dosed them out perfectly and created a cadence for the meal. So, you know, we all kind of felt it and then we just kind of went along for the ride. And by the end of it, we were just like just elated at this beautiful experience that we just had. Nobody overconsumed. Nobody got like too hammered and had to leave. Everyone just went with the ride and it was just very well orchestrated. So I would say, you know, make sure you have someone there who knows how to cook with cannabis and dose it appropriately because it can get ugly otherwise. Yes. And if as anybody who's eaten any edibles for any length of time, myself mm-hmm. included, yeah, I've been on a couple of those negative journeys. <laughs> oh, I definitely know. Not fun. We've yeah. all had those. I've eaten too yes. many or oh, I shouldn't have ate that whole cookie moment. And, yes. You know, yeah. hypermesis is a real thing. <laughs> yes. And the dinner party that I went to as well was with a professional chef and it was the same thing. Like they dosed everything perfectly. They went around ahead of time and asked people what their preferred dose was. So it was sort of tailored to each guest and it really made it, you know, you could relax and enjoy yourself because you knew you weren't going to be blasted by the end of the night and being like, how am I going to drive home? And like all this kind of thing. So (laughs) it was, it was a wonderful experience. So I'm hoping to see more of those types of events happening as, uh, as time goes on, but do you have any, I guess as we draw to the end of this conversation, do you have any best advice for this, you know, for somebody who's wanting to pair food, wine and cannabis together or just appreciate their cannabis more? Yeah, totally. I mean, besides slowing down, um, I'd say if you're if you're new to cannabis, start low and slow. You know, one milligram is great just to kind of get a feeling and get into it. Um you know, the good news is, is you will build a tolerance, just like alcohol. If you kind of drink alcohol regularly, you start building a tolerance for it. Um, you'll still get drunk and you'll still get buzzed, but you're, a, you can handle a lot more as you grow with it. Like my husband was realizing, you know, he used to only be like a two and a half milligram gummy person. And now he can do 10 milligrams and he's amazed. He's like, wow, you know, how did this happen? I'm like, well, you've built a tolerance. Like it's, it's natural for your body to start understanding this. Um, and, and, you know, figuring it out. So I would say start low and slow, and then you can build as you go, as you see fit, never jump from like one to 10 though, like really build yourself up slow. And then I would really encourage people to try their cannabinoids out there. Um, THC is not the only one. I mean, there's what, like 200 different cannabinoids identified in the cannabis plant now. Um, CBG is like one of my favorites. CBG is the mother cannabinoid. And it's also an amplifier, meaning if you take CBG and CBD together, it'll amplify the CBD by three times. Um, And be careful with CBG and THC because it'll also amplify the THC by three times. Um, So try, you know, CBG, CBD, THCV. I can't wait to see more of that. That's rumored to be an appetite suppressant. Lots of tests are going on to prove that. Um, But there's some amazing cannabinoids that have a lot of benefits Um, and a lot of great things to offer. So yeah, I'd say experiment and try some other new things. And most of those two, all of them, CBG, CBD, THCV, CBC are non-psychoactive. So you don't have to worry about getting too high or anything with those. Now, are you starting to see a lot of those in the California market? Because in Canada, I don't think I've seen too much CBG yet. I've started to see like CBN in particular is coming out. And with CBD, but I haven't seen CBG yet or the THCV. Is that what you said as well? Yeah, THCV. Yeah. I haven't seen products with that in it yet either. Oh, we're seeing a lot more here. I mean, CBN is huge here. I mean, CBN is yeah. great for, for sleep. Um, uh, yeah, we're seeing CB, CBN, CBG is really growing here also, particularly in the hemp field, though. So there's a lot of CBG in the hemp world. Uh, but we're seeing more and more here in the THC side, too, in the rec side, um, especially because the fires here in California are causing a lot of growers to pick a lot earlier, which means their CBG levels are a lot higher in their, in their flowers. Also means potency is lower. So all those potency hunters got something coming to them. Um, (laughs) But yeah, I think we're seeing a lot of them. It's definitely a growing trend here. And I do not see that slowing down. I see that just increasing, you know, incrementally. No, there's so much more to explore with all the cannabinoids too. So, So much. um, 
I am curious because you mentioned you use a vaporizer and I also love using a vaporizer as well because I find the taste that you get from it is incredible. Yeah. I like, I didn't even know what I didn't know until I started using a vaporizer. Like it was like a the eureka moment when you're like, <laughs> this is what everybody's talking about. And <laughs> I'm just curious if you have a particular favorite that you like to use. of a yeah. vaporizer. No, totally. I have, there's two I like to use. I mean, um, if I'm home and I'm in a good setting and, and it, cause it's kind of big, I love the volcano. The volcano is just like the purest, most beautiful experience possible. And it just like, I love the volcano, but it's kind of big and bulky and not very good to transport with. And it's, you know, it's a lot of cleaning and not very, not kind of messy. So to me, that's one of the best ways. But when you're on the go or you want something quick and easy, I go to my Omura and that's O-M-U-R-A. And Omura is this uh, heat not burn vaporizer technology where you get a little straw and you pack the straw with your flour and then you put that straw into the vaporizer and it heats it and then you smoke it through the straw. And it's oh, cool. so clean and you know very easy to use. And then I get that pure terpene hit and terpene character. The only you know the only drawback it does use these um, you know the recycled is recycled uh, paper straws. Is I do get a little bit of that cart the paper flavor in the beginning. Um, it burns off after like my second hit. But that's the only thing I have to try to get over. I did hear they're coming out with some other alternatives where that won't be an issue anymore, like some okay. ceramic straws. So I'm excited for right. that. I'll have to look that up. I've never heard of that vaporizer, but there's so many great ones out there that, and I kind of love trying all the different ones. So yeah, yes. definitely interested in checking that out. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with the listeners of Bite Me before we part ways tonight, Elizabeth? Um, I mean, it was, it was a... It was an amazing experience going through the Gangier. I got to meet great people like you yes. and, you know, and share our passion for this plant. It's it's an amazing plant. I've seen it do incredible things for people. And I'm really excited to be a part of this industry and, and part of, you know, helping it grow. You know, right now I'm working with a company called Cureleaf, which is the largest cannabis company in the world. Um, we're in 23 different states. We own a huge, uh, huge operation in Europe. And I really like their focus on what they're doing. You know, they do a lot to give back to the community, but they also do a lot for innovation and really trying to, you know, give consumers what they really need in the purest, you know, highest quality fashion possible. So I'm happy to be a part of that. Well, you know what? The world is better off for having you as part of it as well, because your ability to take complex things like the nuances of wine and cannabis and distill them into a way that people can easily understand uh, I think is really valuable. And as the cannabis industry grows, more and people are, are going to be wanting to look for that kind of education because there's so much more to cannabis than the THC. And we're just scratching the surface right now. And so we need people like you out there sharing with the world the beautiful nuances of cannabis. So thank you so much, Elizabeth. I really appreciate you being here with me and uh, helping to educate the listeners of Bite Me about food and wine pairing and cannabis pairing as well. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been amazing. I'm happy that we got to continue our conversation and our journey as Gangiers. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks, Elizabeth. I hope that inspires you to slow down and to really savor the wine, the cannabis, the food that you're enjoying, to try and notice the flavors and the tastes. Close your eyes and just slow everything down to really enjoy it, to savor the moments. Because those are really what life is all about, isn't it? And I hope you're having a chance that you'll have a chance to try some of these pairing techniques that she gave us. And I would love to hear how it goes. If you put together a little dinner party or a little something for someone you love or just some experimentation on your own, I would love to hear how it goes and how you're able to use some of these tips and tricks to really make the most of it. I hope you all stay healthy, my friends. And until next week, stay healthy. Are you tired of trying edibles that are inconsistent in strength and flavor? Attempting to figure out your tolerance? Do you want to take control of your edibles experience and find the optimum combination of factors that results in the best outcome? If so, this edibles journal is perfect for you. The Bite Me Edibles Journal provides a convenient and organized way for you to track and record your edibles experience, whether it's homemade edibles or store-bought. It includes 48 fillable pages it's sized 8.5 by 11 for plenty of writing space, includes information on calculating the potency of homemade edibles, and it was created by an edibles expert. Whether you're a seasoned edibles enthusiast or just starting out on your cannabis journey, 
the Bite Me Edibles Journal is an essential tool for anyone interested in enjoying their edibles to the fullest. Take control of your high life with this convenient and helpful resource. Add it to your Amazon cart today. Tap the link in the show notes.